why should you care about design thinking? A lot of people will tell you, you guys gotta be innovative, you guys gotta be creative. But they don't necessarily tell you how, how you should do this. Um, so design thinking actually gives you a process. It's a process to help you be more innovative and get creative. Um, and it's a process to help you build your creative You already know design thinking, probably, but you just haven't formalized it in the right, like doing it in the right order. So that's what we're going to do today. Some background, David Kelly, he's a founder of IEO, and he's also founded the Stafford Design School. And we use this process of design thinking, and it can be potentially a transformational process. Um, shuttle, you know, a chair, it's all the same to us. We, like, want to figure out how 
how to innovate in, in by using our process of flying. Project leader is Peter Skillman, a 35-year-old Stanford engineer. Project leader because he's good with groups, not because of seniority. He's only been at IDO for six years. The rest of the team is eclectic, but that's typical here. Whitney Mortar, Harvard MBA. Peter Coughlin, linguist. Tom Kelly, Dave's brother, marketing expert. Jane Fulton Suri, psychologist. Alex Kazax, 26, a biology major, who's turned down medical school three times because he's having too much fun at IDO. Safety emerges early as an important issue. 22,000 child injuries a year, which is, and so they are hospitalized injuries. I mean, there, there are many others. And theft. It turns out <coughs> the cars are stolen. As the team works, it becomes clear there are no titles here, no permanent assignments. The other side says, it gives a lot of help, says, be safe. That's <laughs> safe. I'll give you a big red ball on a, on, a, on, a, on a post, and that says you're a big guy. If you got a ball, you're a senior vice president. You know, what do I get? The death, the red ball, it's all <laughs> In a very innovative culture, you can't have a kind of hierarchy of here's the boss and the next person down, the next person down, the next person down. Because it's impossible that the boss is the one who's had the insightful experience with shopping carts. It's just not possible. The team splits into groups to find out firsthand what the people who use, make, and repair shopping carts really think. Okay, go. The problem with the plastic cart is the wind catches it. And these things have been clocked at 35 across the parking lot. <laughs> oh, man, that's actually pretty the, the trick is to find these real experts and so that you can learn much more quickly than you could by just kind of doing it in a normal way and, and trying to learn about it yourself. From everything I read, these things aren't that safe either. You know? Um, so probably the seat itself is going to have to be redesigned. One of the interesting things for me is looking at how people really don't like to let go of the car, except for the <coughs> professional shopper whose strategy is to leave the car to various places. 3.30 in the afternoon, and the group is back at IDEO. There is no let up. Each team is going to demonstrate and communicate and share everything that they've learned today. A uh, shopping cart was clocked at 35 miles an hour, shopping through a parking lot in the van. We were in the store with two hours, and, and it was truly frightening to see the kind of stuff going on. You ought to designate some people to make damn sure that the store owner's point of view is represented. After nine straight hours, the team is tired. They call it a day. So, uh, well, uh, that's great. Thanks a lot. You had a great time today. IDEO's mantra for innovation is written everywhere. One conversation at a time. Stay focused. Encourage wild ideas. Defer judgment. Build on the ideas of others. Uh, that's the hardest thing for people to do is to uh, restrain themselves from the uh, uh, criticizing an idea, so if anybody starts to nail an idea, they get the bill. <laughs> the ideas pour <coughs> out and are posted on the walls. <laughs> oh, the blind, the, the privacy blind. Like when you're buying six cases of condoms, you know, and no one If it doesn't nest, we don't have a solution. Organized chaos. Uh, it's not organized. Um, what it is, is it's focused <coughs> chaos. Vote with your post it not, not with an idea that's cool, but with an idea that's cool and buildable. Um, if it's too far out there and it can't be built in a day, then I don't think we should put it in. Enlightened trial and error succeeds over the planning of blown <coughs> Enlightened trial and error succeeds over the planning of the low genius. If anything sums up IDEO's approach, that is it. Worried that the team is drifting, what can only be called a group of self-appointed adults under Dave Kelly holds an informal side session. Four or five. Four, four, five. Four or five teams, and we, and we give each team a need area. It becomes very autocratic for a very short period of time when defining what things people are going to work on. If you don't work under time constraints, you, you can never get anything done because it's a messy process to go on forever. We're back at the shop, it is six o'clock. The full mock ups are ready for showing. Baskets also can be, if you think you will have more volume, baskets can be put in. A modular shopping cart. You pile hand baskets onto it. A high-tech cart that gets you through the traffic jam at checkout. That you could mount a scanner on the shopping cart so that you as the customer, as you pull it off the shelf, would scan each item. One that's built around child safety. And another that lets shoppers talk to the supermarket staff remotely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
But the adults, again, decide more work needs to be done before the mock-ups can be combined with one last prototype. Why don't we have all the parts come up here for a second? I think you take a piece of each one of these ideas and kind of back it off a little bit and then put it in the, yeah, in the right. design. The design is still not there, but there's another motto in IDO, fail often in order to succeed sooner. And some of the team will be up half the night trying to put together a design that finally <laughs> does work. A cart which is designed to cost about the same as today's carts is different in every other way. <laughs> well, I, I'm very proud of the team. I think it's it's great. This, does this work for you? Works for me great. It's also beautiful. The cart's wheels turn 90 degrees so it can move sideways. No more lifting up the rear in a tight spot. And you shop in a totally different way. The bags are hung on hooks on the cart's frame. Remember, there is no basket here. At first, I was a little shocked, but I think it's you have some fantastic ideas here. It needs a little refining, but I think that it's great. I mean, we would, we would want them. She also gave us some really good comments about how we can make this thing better. A lot of hours. Also, an open mind, a boss who demands fresh ideas be quirky and clash with his, a belief that chaos can be constructive and teamwork. A great deal of teamwork. And these are the recipe for how innovation takes place. This is Jack Smith for Nightline, Palo Alto, California. Sorry that it's so soft. <laughs> so, what I like about this, I think, is that anybody can do it. Like, you don't have to be a specialist in anything. You don't have to have a certain experience to do it. So, and it's better if actually a lot of different kind of people do it. So this is the process. It's a five-step process that we're going to walk through. It's empathy, define, idea, prototype, and test, and get feedback. So the whole point of the process is to make the human element just as important as the business and the technical. A lot of times, businesses will go into business thinking that as long as the technology works and it's awesome and I have a business plan, then it's going to take off. But people got to want it. It's got to fit into people's lives. So traditionally, a lot of companies, especially technical companies, are more on the analytical side. So design thinking kind of pushes pushes you towards the middle where you get some of the intuitive side, but you're not totally like all just on gut reaction, touchy-feely. So it kind of brings you into the middle where you're actually listening to what people need, how people feel. As a comparison, design thinking is designing with your customer versus designing for your customer. And it's a very collaborative type of process. I mean, It'll bring together companies that are usually siloed. Um, here's an example of design thinking where they needed to gain a lot of empathy. So there was a group of Stanford students that were challenged to build a better incubator for Nepal because there was a high infant mortality rate because these, these infants were dying of hypothermia. They were getting too cold and they were dying. So they thought, oh, they, they must need better incubators. So they started, you know, building an incubator, but they thought, oh, well, we need to actually go get to them. So the group traveled to Nepal, and they went to the hospitals, and they found all these incubators, but they were empty. And they asked the doctors, what's wrong with your incubators? And the doctors did nothing. They're fine. They work. So they thought, well, what's going on? So they actually went out to where the babies were being born, and they were being born in homes where people were able to access hospitals. They didn't have transportation to get to the hospital. So they had their babies at home. They weren't able to keep them warm. So they were actually born outside of the hospital. So this, the team had to completely rethink what it meant to build an incubator. And this is what they came up with. It's like a little baby sleeping bag that mothers could have at home. And they could put their baby in to keep them warm while they're in transport or before they can get to the hospital. So this is another quote. Think with your hands. Do something. Not the reverse. So we are going to build. This is our challenge. 
we're going to do a wallet challenge. So we're going to try and design a better wallet or a better solution for a wallet. So. So I want you, I'm going to turn out a piece of paper, I want you to draw what your ideal wallet would look like. Okay, I'm knowing what you know about your wallet. This is cool. People don't care about your solutions, they care about your problems. And I know as a business owner, or I assume, I've never been a business owner, but I assume that it's very personal and it's very... Like people need my solution. But what you actually have to think about is how does your solution fit into their life and solve their problem. And so that's the mindset we're going to get into for empathy. Um, so there's a lot of ways to gain empathy. You can observe. You can observe people in, their, in the context of their life using your product or going through a process or experience. You can immerse yourself in the same process, you can go and use the product yourself, go through the process, or you can engage. You can engage with your end user. And that's usually like an interview. So if I was going to carry my stuff over this way, you know, one of my problems would be if I put it in my bag, I'd have to sit on the brake and watch, you know? So like, but so, what I would like to have is to take you out one, to only carry one thing. I can't conceive of how it's going to be. Do now, oh, actually, but that's what I would like, you know? And then we have to look these up. Tremendous. So but I would say, so I'm looking at it, I'm trying to stuff that's important and that I might need to use and I need to protect it. And I need to have that's my motivation. It's fault tolerant. Right? That's what I So what are your, so what, so you, what are your goals? Why do you want to walk? Because I know the business is looking for all this stuff. So when I go to the door, it's going like that. And it goes through. So you want to consolidate all the stuff. Why do you walk in your back pocket and why not in your pocket? How long do you I did. I got the idea for that. I was like, who likes that? 
I'm sure they want to use it. Well, it's got a screen, so I mean, that's going to emit some light. Um, and also, even though we already have the. Uh, no sound? No sound. I don't. I haven't done that. Uh, I guess we could add that in, I guess. Yes. You like the other one? What was the other one you wanted? I'm kind of coming up with that. It's really <laughs> Well, what I did was, uh, uh, was I was I but I also just added a very sort of profile kind of So that one, how do you guys market it? Well, you market directly to the comment of the Well, that's kind of cool. So the next step is prototyping. We're going to prototype a solution. Something to put into your customer's hands, your partner's hands. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have prefer fail early, fail often. But I don't think it's really fail. I think this is more about iterating. So you want to get something into your customer's hands as soon as possible and as cheaply as possible. And with prototyping, it's very easy to do. You can do very low resolution prototype. And I just show it to your customer and say, this is kind of what you had in mind. And you can get some feedback immediately. Older stuff that we've got. I'm working on it. How many years so are you building one for him and you build one for you? No, we actually. Yep, you build one for each other. You build one for each other. Oh, yeah, good. He can be our team. One reason why you build multiple prototypes, hopefully, and you come up with your multiple prototypes, is that you don't get attached emotionally to your prototype. So the mindset is a lot of times you want a prototype as if you think you're right. Like, this is, this is going to be an awesome solution for my customers. But when you're testing and when you're going to get feedback, you want to be in the mindset of it's a learning experience. So you want to understand what's wrong with your prototype. Why doesn't this work for you? So that's how you want to approach it. And I want to make sure that spelt was the right word. And it is uh, slim and elegant is the definition. So, um, uh, the problem that I'm that I feel like the wallet that he currently has, there's a number of things. One, it destroys his business cards, uh, and number two, it's it's hard to access all the cards that he wants to carry. But it also gets very big because there's lots of material between each every there's pockets and folds and it, it, the the material is folding upon itself, and you wind up with a lot of material pretty quickly. Um, so I, I'm not particularly happy with this design, but it is the only thing that I've come up with is kind of it's a it's an accordion, but the but the cards are actually held on both sides, and it's not holding them very well right now. But um, the cards are actually held on both sides of the material, so you don't have as much material between each one. Um, and um, and then of course the money bends. In the in the main fold, just like it does now, it's just eliminating some of the leather material um, to make it skinnier, but yet giving the same amount of privacy once it's closed. Good, I like it. He has a problem of being a, a wallet order. So the more slots he has, the bigger and bigger the wallet gets. And if aliens were to come down, they'd look at both of us and say, "Well, why why do these guys, the guys, have these big..." Bubbles on the one side of their butts. <laughs> so it's for uh, job security for chiropractors. Um, but anyway, so so his main goal was simplification, less pockets, uh, easier time of, in terms of managing your lifestyle, and um, no more back pains. So uh, we came up with um, the wallet watch, and it would function as a regular watch so that you can replace the one that he currently has. Um, but it also would have um, um, L LCD screen where you can, um, you know, print out like uh, or display information that you need or 
uh, QR codes to scan, things like that. They would also have um, uh, uh, a backup kind of pocket inside the van where you could keep you know, a 20 or a $100 bill just in case something were to happen. And then it would have a flip out magnetic strip to be accommodating different locales where they may or may not have penetration of you know, the e-payment services. Um, so we have a couple other features. It's hard to, maybe hard to see there, but this is actually an OLED display also with a solar panel built in. And you know, it's all Wi-Fi, 3G enabled, etc. You know, quintuple band, whatever it is now. You can get like, you know, this is all configurable so you can change it to suit your mood. You can get like flight information, you know, uh, put your surf report on here, all that kind of stuff. So it's customizable based on based on what you want to do. And this will all be like you know rugged, uh, you know O-rings, uh, maybe aluminum or magnesium case. So it's be really strong. Um, let's see what else? But also the main thing, and I think there's actually a project like this on Kickstarter. But uh, basically the idea is you link the the, fault, the wall and the phone together. Because um, one of his other main concerns is retention, and he really doesn't want to lose his wallet. Um, so we'll have them connect to each other and there'll be a button on here and you can summon your phone and, and an app on here, you can summon your wallet. And then finally just as a uh, kind of, you know, backup to that, we have a good old physical uh, means of retention. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. <clears throat> so um, during my interview I found out that uh, Omar feels uh, insecure by uh, having large objects in his pockets. <laughs> and that's why he actually doesn't use a wallet at all. All he uses is a money clip. And uh, so I thought if he would ever use a wallet, then it would be small, compact. And um, the one thing that I found uh, weird is that he leaves his, car, uh, his house key in the car. And um, so I have this little wallet here. It's basically two metal plates held together by a rubber band type of thing, uh, integrated key, and uh, you can put all your credit cards in here. And there you go, and you could also put the whole thing with the rubber band around your phone and basically just have one thing in your pocket, and uh, no embarrassment. Or <laughs> <laughs> Are the um, just the eye scan and choose your payment option or membership and so on. We went with a physical device where, if you look at, like in my wallet, I mostly had it in my pocket, but my wife said, you gotta carry a wallet because it's too unorganized. So if I break it, if we break it down, we have stuff with barcodes, we have stuff with just info, with cash, and things with um, magnetic strips. The hardest one would be the magnetic strip to get rid of because it's programmed and so on. So what we have here is a case that's integrated in with the iPhone and Siri. So what you do is you tell them, say, you know, Jerry, um, I need some cash, $20, please. And then, you know, get $20. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm at the airport, right? You go to the airport and they say, I need to see your ID. I go, Siri, I need my ID. <laughs> yeah, right? I want my ID to put it back in. Like, Siri, I need 50 cents. Oh, 50 cents. And then they say, huh? perfectly, look at this. And then they go to the store and I say, okay, I go to this store, I'm paying with, this is my business account, so I say, Siri, I'd like to put this on my United business account. One, 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 one. Pro okay, this one, authenticate my thumb, and then here we go. Slice, slide it through, and I put it back. But does it make a strip to pull it out? Yeah, it goes out, watch it. Siri, credit card. <laughs> business card. <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you, and then, then we're done. Yeah. <laughs>